The next day, Samuel was up bright and early. He had begun the day by painting in the garden, but as his eyes grew tired, he decided to put down his paintbrush and go for a walk in the woods with Alfie. Samuel loved to observe the perfectly straight shafts of light as they burst through the tree canopy into the woodlands. Later, when they had returned from their walk, Samuel passed several hours scrapbooking photographs of his grandchildren. Before he knew it, it was late in the afternoon. Granddad, Granddad, we're here, came the sound of two young voices. Two smiling children walked towards Samuel as he sat in his favorite armchair. One of the children was a girl about eleven years of age. She was tall and skinny and had braided brown hair. Her face was awash with freckles. She was carrying a large chocolate cake. The other child was a boy about eight years old. He too had brown hair, and he wore a bright red t-shirt that said, Save Trees, Avoid Homework. It was obvious that they were brother and sister. They were two of Samuel's four grandchildren. Mom walked us to the garden gate. She says she'll stop by later for dinner, after we've been to the fair. She's going to bring us a meatloaf that she made, said the girl, whose name was Amy. Samuel grimaced. Mom says she knows you don't like meatloaf, but you have to eat it anyway because it's good for you said the boy, who was clearly missing his two front teeth. "'Oh, she does, does she?' replied Samuel. "'Yep,' said the boy. "'How come you're here?' said Samuel, laughing. "'Did you make that chocolate cake?' The boy, whose name was Ethan, smiled boldly. "'I didn't make it, but I was the one who said it should be a double chocolate cake and not just chocolate cake,' explained Ethan." Oh, well, I guess that's a good enough reason for you to come to the fair with Amy and me, said Samuel, teasing his grandson. Let's go put the cake in the kitchen. In the kitchen, Samuel poured two glasses of ice-cold water and placed a striped straw in each glass. Have a cold drink before we go, Samuel instructed. Moments later, they heard the sound of a very loud voice. Samuel! yelled Jack. You need to do something about that dog. He's run off with my hat again. <coughs> Samuel and the children burst out laughing. At that moment, Jack appeared in the kitchen, looking a little flustered. Why, if it isn't my f two favorite children, Jack exclaimed. Samuel poured two more glasses of water and joined his guests at the kitchen table. All four sat and chatted and sipped their drinks. Grandpa, said Ethan, why does it look like the straw is separated where it meets the water? See, the part of the straw in the water is magnified and looks like it's bent. That's a really good question, Ethan, replied Samuel eagerly. Well, where should I begin? This could take a while, warned Jack, smiling the tiniest bit. You may have learned by now that light can be transmitted or passed through some objects, but not others, began Samuel. Objects that most light can pass through, such as eyeglasses or an empty glass, are called transparent, and objects that light cannot pass through, such as a tackle box or Jack's hat, are called opaque. My hat's been called worse, Jack shouted. Amy and Ethan giggled. What about objects that some light can go through, like frosted glass or tracing paper? asked Amy. I think there's a name for those, too. Yes, said Samuel. Those objects are called translucent. They let a little bit of light pass through, and it scatters or spreads out, causing the object you see through them to look fuzzy. Cool, exclaimed Ethan. We're about to start learning all this stuff in third grade. Yeah, it is cool, joined in Amy, and now you'll be a little ahead, Ethan. You may have also learned, continued Samuel, that when light waves travel through different transparent substances, such as through the air and then through a drinking glass, or through a glass and then through the water, they change their speed, explained Samuel. Amy nodded. 
I remember learning that when a light wave suddenly changes speed, it quickly changes its direction and looks like it's bending. That's why when you look into a river and see fish, they seem closer to the surface than they actually are. Does that apply to dogs, too? yelled Jack, remembering catching Alfie. The children looked at Jack with puzzled expressions. Oh, it's a long story, said Sam, laughing. To return to your question, Ethan, that's exactly why a straw standing in a glass of water appears to bend or even break apart as it enters the water. This sudden change of speed and direction of the light waves is called refraction. Refraction, repeated Ethan. Samuel nodded and continued. In fact, the refraction of light is how a concave or convex lens works in many instruments or tools that we use. Samuel went on. A convex lens curves outward so that it's thicker in the middle than it is at the edges. Rays of light passing through a convex lens are forced to change direction and move towards each other, making things look bigger than they are if they are close enough to the lens. Convex lenses are used in instruments such as microscopes, magnifying glasses, binoculars, telescopes, and cameras. The lenses in my eyeglasses are convex to help me see close images better when I'm painting. Samuel continued, On the other hand, a concave lens curves inward like a cave and is thinner in the middle than at the edges. Light rays pass through the concave lens are forced to change direction and move away from each other, making things look smaller. Cameras use lenses to focus the light rays inside the camera to record an image. Lenses are also used in security cameras and peepholes that are in some doors to help the background look wider and easier to see. I don't want to interrupt your lecturing, Samuel, but I've heard it's going to be busy at the fair tonight, so we should get going, said Jack as he finished his drink. Good point, Jack. We'd better get ourselves out of here. Yay, y y yelled Ethan excitedly. I want us all to go on the chairplanes. We'll have to see about that, replied Jack. I need to be able to walk home from the fair in one piece, not a million zillion pieces. The two children laughed at Jack, and then Ethan ran off to rescue Jack's hat from Alfie. Fifteen minutes later, having arrived at the fair, they promptly bought a roll of tickets for various rides as well as four helpings of cotton candy. They stood together for a short time eating the sweet cotton candy and observing all the fun of the fair. Finally, Amy asked, What should we do first? I have a special request, said Samuel. I have been teaching Jack about the science of light. I promised him a trip to the House of Mirrors. It was more like a threat, retorted Jack. The two children laughed at Jack's grumpy reply. The House of Mirrors is so much fun, exclaimed Amy. Let's go, cried Ethan, as he grabbed his grandfather's hand. And with that, the four of them made their way toward the giant red, white, and blue sign that said, Welcome to the House of Mirrors. A man dressed like a clown stood at the entrance. He smiled and took their tickets. Upon entering the partly wooden, partly tented structure, he disco they discovered an array or selection of distortion mirrors. They had stood in front of each mirror. As they stood in front of each mirror, they witnessed a variety of optical illusions. I have a head shaped like a giant watermelon, pronounced Jack. This is so cool, said Ethan eagerly, looking into the mirror that had convex and concave parts. Look, I'm really tall and skinny. Really, really wide, exclaimed Amy, looking at her reflection in the mirror. How is this possible? asked Ethan, as he observed his new shape. Well, began Samuel, I'm glad you asked that question, Ethan. Oh no, I sense another speech, said Jack, and at that, 
Jack walked toward the entrance to the mirrored maze. "'You're going to miss my talk,' said Samuel, as he watched Jack walk away. "'That's fine with me,' Jack replied. "'Actually, it's a very simple concept,' expla excla explained Samuel, ignoring Jack's comment. "'Mirrors are made of a reflective material. "'Each one of these mirrors has a different shape. "'Depending on the shape of the mirror, "'it can be used to bring light rays together or spread them apart. "'Some of these mirrors have concave and convex parts. "'Some are slightly twisted, and others are even folded.' Samuel continued. Generally, convex mirrors make images look smaller, whereas concave mirrors can make images look larger. When you put them together, you get some really funny shapes. So different mirrors do different things, said Ethan, who had been listening intently to his grandfather. Yes, for example, continued Samuel, a convex mirror, like the ones on the sides of your school bus, curve outward so that rays of light striking them are forced to change direction and move away from each other, making distant things look smaller and the background wider. This allows the bus driver to see more area around the bus. Objects very close to these mirrors may look wider and distorted. Cool, exclaimed Ethan. It is cool, Samuel agreed. In comparison, a concave mirror, like the large makeup mirror your mom has, or the shaving mirror your father has, curves inward so that light rays hit it and are forced to change direction and move toward each other, making things look larger, explained Samuel. I get it, I get it, exclaimed Amy happily. When light strikes either a concave or a convex mirror, it is, either refl it is reflected in different ways at different angles. Right on the button, said Samuel. Light reflects differently in each mirror in such a way that it alters the view. The waves of light provide a clear but altered image. Hey, you guys, I'm kind of lost in here, called a very loud voice. It was Jack. So anytime you're ready, I'd welcome being rescued. The children laughed out loud. Well, you did go wandering off, yelled back Samuel. Hold on, hold on. We're on our way. Samuel and his grandchildren made their way toward the entrance to the mirrored maze. The maze was a series of narrow, mirrored corridors. The trick was to find an opening into a new corridor, and if you followed the path correctly, you would eventually find your way out. However, because the walls were made entirely out of framed mirrors, it was difficult to find the openings, and people had been known to walk around and around for a very long time. Eventually, Samuel, Amy, and Ethan found Jack. They basically followed the sound of his very loud complaints. Once they were all together, they put Ethan in charge of finding the way out. It didn't take him long to figure out the way to the exit. Once out of the maze, they spent the rest of the evening enjoying the fun of the fair. The children went on a variety of rides. They also ate ice cream and promised not to tell their mom they had had dessert before dinner. Finally, it was time to go. Samuel had promised his daughter, Anna, that the children would be home in time for dinner. Time to go, children, said Samuel softly. Oh, Granddad, exclaimed Ethan, we haven't been on the cheriplanes. Please, can we go on them, please, pleaded Ethan. What do you say, Jack? Are you up for a little ride through the cool evening air, said Samuel. Samuel, if I didn't come back alive... If I don't come back alive, are you prepared to feed my fish? yelled Jack. No problem, I'll take real good care of him, replied Samuel calmly. Okay then, let's do it. They reached the chairplane ride just as it had stopped. They found four chairs all in a row and seated themselves. They fastened the chain across the front of the seat and waited for the ride to begin. Several minutes later, they began to move through the air in perfect circles, 
Slowly they rose higher and higher into the air as fairground music began to play. Samuel and Jack looked at the children's eager faces and smiled with content.